Hello, and welcome to another episode of Dr. Things. I want you to imagine for a moment that your stepson is murdered in what many to believe to be a ritualistic, satanic child sacrifice. That's a pretty riveting and hard to deal with, but he's not the only victim. He's murdered along with two of his other second grade friends. A search goes underway, and eventually, three teenage boys are convicted of the crime. The three teenage boys who would be charged with the crime and later convicted were Damien Eccles, who was sentenced to death, Jason Baldwin, who was sentenced to life, and Jesse Miskelly Jr., who was sentenced to life plus 40 years. These three boys would later become the topic of controversy and conversation, mainly implicated as being falsely accused and falsely arrested due to something called satanic panic. And the documentary was called Paradise Lock. There were three in total. Now, if you have not seen them, I highly suggest you watch them, unless you're completely unfamiliar with our channel. We've already done a deep dive on this topic as well. This is our probably last video covering the West Memphis Street. Ah, once those boys gave the uh, opinion, the court, uh, public, uh, court of public opinion, rather, to uh, mount enough pressure with uh, celebrities like Johnny Depp, Natalie Maines, Eddie Vedder, to name a few, um, to get them to be able to have this alpha sleep. They get released, uh, agreeing to plead guilty but with time served. While all of that was in the motion and shortly after their release, one of the stepfathers, Harry Hobbs, gets accused by the court of public opinion and by the defense team of the West Memphis Three as pretty much being the one who most likely killed the boy. Now, that's shocking. One of the stepfathers named John Mike Byers, who's now deceased, who used to be on Terry Pop's side, even switches sides, and now all the focus is on Terry. Not a fun position to be, but to be fair, um, when I go to interview Terry, no question was actually off limits. And he did answer every single question. And I'm asking some very heavy questions during the interview. I'd be very interested to know in this interview if it changes your mind on Terry Hobbs or the West Memphis Three. And let me know in the comments below. Without further ado, let's get to the interview. Hello, Terry. Thank you for being with us today. Well, thank you for having me. Mr. Hobbs, uh, Terry, I just want to start off with saying that I have watched all the uh, Paradise Lost uh, documentaries. I've also watched West of Memphis, uh, The Devil's Knot. I think most people get their information from the HBO documentaries uh, Paradise Lost, which is why I want to talk to you. And I'd like to start off with the question of when you first found out that TV had died and that the other two boys had died as well. How did that feel? Well, at the time that it was happening, we we had been up since May the 5th, you know, all searching, doing what parents do, searching all night long, and didn't even know what we were searching for. You know, we was just searching for our kids, you know, and the direction kept leading us uh, towards this three-acre uh, plot of woods called Robin Hood Hills. And that's a, a piece of land right there close to the neighborhood where children, I guess, would go play. And you know, we didn't know nothing about it, didn't know what it was called, you know, drive past it every day and pay no attention to it. So as we searched all night, you know, the police finally got involved with searches on May the 6th, uh, around eight o'clock in the morning, you know, we started seeing search uh, equipment come out and, you know, and the police. 
So, you know, I think it was in the early afternoon when they discovered them. So we got wind. We was at another part of town looking, and we got wind that uh, they were looking or had found uh, some boys. So we didn't know. So we headed over to where they were found. And when we get over there, there's vehicles and people up in there for in that direction and and we, I noticed a uh, a crime tape put up you know and that didn't settle good but you know I went up to ask you know what's going on here and I was told by Gary Gitchell he was the inspector in charge of the case that uh, we found three boys and it looks like a homicide and he's I stood there and looked at him, you know, probably in shock. And he says, it looks like they've been murdered. And, you know, I just sat down on the ground. Just, my stomach just fell plumb down, and I couldn't believe what he just told me. And I looked back. I sat there for a few minutes, and I get up, and I start back to where my wife was. And she just, her knees just give out, and she landed on the ground crying, yelling. You know, it was a, it was a shocking moment. You know, we didn't expect this. We didn't know what to expect, and we sure didn't expect that. That's what we found when we got to where we'd seen the crime scene tape. I can only imagine that. I couldn't fathom the pain and the agony that I'm going through when they lose a child. I think the film does a good job, The Paradise Lost, um, does a good job during the first one of actually showing newer and Cam's reaction. I think it caps it pretty good. Um, can you tell me when the uh, Paradise Lost documentary people uh, showed up in your life? Well, Paradise Lost turned up in the first trial. Uh, just before that, you know, they come weaseling their way in to want to make these documentaries. And you know, I think us dads, there was three of us, and I, we all didn't want that, you know, because we di didn't know what to expect from them either. And so they went behind us dads and got with the moms, and the moms signed the contracts and they paid the mothers. So at the beginning, toward the first trial, is when they came about. So basically all of you are compensated for your participation to be in the document. Well, they, you know, give the money to the ladies and, you know, and, and there was not no stopping them from doing whatever they wanted to do. And just to frame this more, give a better frame of reference, uh, once Damian Eccles and Jesse Muskelly Jr. and Jason Baldwin were actually arrested and, uh, you know, they came known as Les Smith's uh, three, did the people in your community generally feel that they caught the right people? Or was there a doubt from the onset of the guilt of these uh, three individuals? Well, as far as the public and, you know, the families, you know, we were only being told by the police, you know, that we made an arrest and we wanted everybody to show up, you know, their first preliminary hearing in court. So we did. And yeah, it was a rage. You know, people was mad that these boys had done this. People were somewhat satisfied that they, you know, they arrested the right ones. And, you know, so the journey begins. You know, it starts there. And were you personally satisfied that they caught the right people, that these were the culprits? Well, I've always been satisfied as they were the right three because that's all I've ever known, you know? And until, I've said this a million times, but until, you know, I see something else that leads me in another direction, I, that's all I know to believe. So, the fact that there was no DNA evidence linking them to the murders and uh, it was eventually called a satanic crime at first, but then that was driven to fall, that didn't sway you one way or the other or make you think any differently at all? No, sir. People in this country, 
they can say and do anything they want and they can make a circus out of a case and that's all they've done to our case. Now we on this side of it, we don't appreciate that. But you know what? You can't do nothing about it in this country. And there's some laws that need to be addressed. There's some things that need to change in America because of stuff like this that, uh, that is allowed. And no, we don't appreciate it. But you, like I said, you can't do nothing about it. They have get it. They get out here and they slander everybody in the case, from the judge, the district attorneys, the prosecuting attorneys, uh, the families, and there is not a thing that can be done about it in this country. But I definitely have to say that the documentary only makes the West Memphis Three and their defense team look good. Everybody else looks suspicious. They're not the angels that everybody thought they was. If, if people believe that, go back and, and have the people to listen to Jesse Miss Kelly's confessions. And he's had several, I understand that. But some of his confessions, he, he tells what happened to who, by who, and you will see that these boys was not the angels that they are made out to be today. You know, the documentaries make it out like uh, Jesse Miskelly Jr. was a very limited intelligence um, and that the police basically coerced a confession out of him. Do you uh, believe something like this may have happened with the West Memphis Police Department coercing a confession out of uh, Jesse Miskelly? Or do you believe um, Jesse Miskelly Jr.'s initial confession? Well, I believe his confession. I, I think he thought he saw a way out of this, you know, and so he was going to come clean, or maybe he he was the one of them that had somewhat of a conscience, you know, and couldn't live with it. So, you know, and he called himself going to try to make it right. And doing that, he implicated himself, and they already knew that, you know. Uh, but in, in, anyhow, he got himself, and he was just as involved when he chased down one of the little boys, brought him back, and stood there and watched him kill him. I just can't imagine being in your shoes. What's it like to have to sit in court and listen to a kid's confession of another person talking about murdering your son and other kids? Oh, it was. You know, sitting through the trials, uh, we learned things that I never would have imagined, you know. These boys was out here bragging about it, you know. And, and I guess they thought, you know, they wasn't going to ever get caught up with. But in the trials, these uh, kids that from the in the town was on the witness stand, you know, talking about hearing them brag about it. You know, sure, it takes a toll on you. You want to get up and slap them, you know, but you, you can't. But they can sure get out here and make a, a circus out of it today. And you can't do nothing about it. See, now you believe so strongly in their guilt. Um, How did you feel when the office police came around and they got released? <laughs> I was there when they got released. And I didn't appreciate it. I got my phone call like every, the rest of us parents got our phone call before the release where the state was telling us they going to release, release them. And sure, you know, he ended up in an argument, a shooting match with the police, or the state, not the police, but the state, the district attorney. And he just let us know we are tired of this case. It's been 18, 19 years, whatever it was at the time, that they have drug us in and out of, a, of the courts on appeals, and we're just tired of it. You know, so we're going to make them plead guilty we're going to give them the Alfred plea, and we're going to release them, you know. And, and sure, that's, I know it's eight, I, I believe it was about 18 years, you know, when that happened, something like that. And I know that's a long time in prison, but look at what they've done. You know, they, one of them was on death row, one was life plus 40, and the other one was life, no parole. They didn't really, there's some sort of justice there but not what they was, you know, given. You just uh, did say that you were actually there upon their release, and 
um, it would be something that I believe somebody who had been a victim um, of this horrible tragedy would want to be there for. Um, and uh, we do see that uh, transpire in uh, the West of Memphis documentary. But at this point uh, in their tale, you're heavily being portrayed as a suspect. And I'm just wondering what that feels like. How does that even come to across? It must seem like absolutely insanity. Hmm. I'll tell you what. If all the documentary people pulled up in my driveway today, I would walk out there and slap them. You know, seriously, that's how I feel about it. I have done no wrong in this. And I have been threatened. I've been jerked off the streets by the police because of death threats. And I don't appreciate this kind of stuff, you know. I'm just out here trying to survive and live a life that's, you know, okay. And then you have to put up with this. I get the threats through the telephone. I get the hate mails. I, I get all kind of things that is senseless. You know, I haven't done a thing wrong to anybody. So even today, you get uh, pulled off the street by police, or you get death threats, or people come up to you and uh, ask you if you killed the boy, they call you a baby killer? Oh, sure, yes sir, it does. And uh, what did it feel like when uh, John Mark Byers basically seemed to switch sides and was on the side of the West Memphis Three, the, the kids that were convicted, now adults, he's now on their side, and he's actually calling you a child killer. There's the child killer, there's the child killer. Uh, how did one react to that? How did that feel? We were on the same side. And if you're if in the documentaries, you know, they kind of attacked Mark Byers in the first trials, the first two trials. And he was their suspect. If you remember, he was the documentary's suspect. Okay, so things changed. The money started coming in to the people, to the families the ones that would take it, and sides start changing, you know? So the more money you give people, the more you can get them to do and say whatever they want, okay? And so I, I kind of believe that the more that they was given to my ex-wife Pam, to Mark, well, the more they get out there and say things that they they, they know is not right, but they're, they're paying them to say it. So you're basically saying money uh, is uh, turns people into an opportunity to tell their own version of the truth or, or weave a story that's incorrect. And that sometimes, I guess, does happen with documentaries. And you've lived this. Uh, you've lived this. So is there any part of the story in Paradise Lost that we should know about that they didn't tell? Oh, there's all kinds of... You know, a documentary is a biased film that someone makes, especially if they if their agenda is against what is being presented. Okay, so here we are in the middle of a triple homicide case. Here comes this documentary people who are subject to, let's change the tone of this. You know, let's say they're not guilty. And that's what these guys have done. You know, and they have spread the word, made the three or four documentaries, and actually there's been a lot of documentaries made about it but on the paradise lost documentaries i think they made three and they know what they're doing they're good at it you know and and and, so, and that's what has caused the state to be picked on all these years it's because, a lot of that is because of the documentaries and the system letting them do it i don't remember which one i saw it on i think it was west of memphis but um David Jacoby basically seems to switch sides or, or implicate you. Um, how does it feel when you see your friend, your main alibi, um, David Jacoby, uh, speaking with the uh, FBI's profile, I believe his name was John Douglas, talking about potential guilt? I mean, what does it feel like to see your friend crying, talking about your potential guilt? Well, uh, David, David Jacoby, he is a friend. He was a friend back then. I haven't talked to him in years, you know, especially since I've seen him on them oxygen channels, uh, doing what he was doing, crying and all that. But again, 
you have to understand how John Douglas works. He's an ex-FBI profile, and his job in this was to go around and intimidate people. He tried it with me. I don't play intimidation. and But David just couldn't overcome it, you know? And David bought into it when they, they pulled up on David in three blacked out SUVs, and he thought it was the FBI coming after him. You know, and it wasn't. It was just the intimidators showed up. And they did a number on David. And David knows the truth about, you know, for our mine and his whereabouts. And all we done was ride around and looking for us three little boys and just, you know, trying to bring them home. And, but David did. He, he did all that crying. And I seen all that. And I'm just thinking, really? But he was scared. Is this why you're no longer friends with him? Well, no. If I if I run upon him today, I would stop and talk to him. And I promise you, he would stop and talk to me. And he was a good guy. I've done a lot for David, you know. And and in the during saying that, he was just a, a good friend. You know, he was a construction worker, steel a steel worker. And a hard-working guy took care of his family, you know, but why? Oh, I guess the intimidation got to him, and, you know, he just couldn't handle it. And did they use any methods like that on you? The same methods, you know. You know, uh, they, my first encounter with John Douglas, why, I thought it was a nice one. He had an, uh, his attorney friend with him, and I thought it was an okay meeting, but, the, and then, you know, between my first and second one, he goes out here and talks to everybody that he can or whoever he talks to. And I don't know, I don't keep up with it, but on my second encounter with Mr. Douglas, why he is, uh, you know, his tone has changed, his demeanor has changed, you know, and, and I could see that. I'm just thinking, you know, something has happened for this to happen for him to start attacking me, you know? And I got up and walked out and left him and they're standing behind me yelling at me to come back. And I just wouldn't do it. I don't play stuff like that. And I can say this too, he done it for the money. Now that brings me to another point. You actually had litigation that stemmed from you being accused. Um, I think you sued Natalie Maines from the Dixie Chicks, right? And I saw the depositions that you had to be in, or rather a deposition, but it was several days. And they asked you some hard-hitting questions. It seemed like there was some negative fallout from that. Do you uh, regret making the decision to sue the Dixie Chicks? No. No, I don't. Uh, I did sue the Dixie The questions are just off-the-wall questions, like things I've never heard of. You know, but I had to sit there and answer them, and sure, it was degrading. And sure, it was aggravating, but you know what? I, at the end of the day, I told the truth about them, and I laid my hand on top of that stack of papers, and it was a stack. And I told that court reporter, I said, this whole stack here is nothing but a bunch of crap. And I stand by that today. Well, I know your family stood by you, and uh, I can see that in the documentary. And it looks like, you know, things kind of went rough for them, too, as a result of uh, being involved in the documentary. Like, there was involvement with uh, your brother and your nephew. You want to talk about it a little bit? They really done a number on my brother. They did. And that was so wrong. And my nephew, that was so wrong. And, you know, but still, people don't care what we say about it. They believe everything wrong. You know, just like it's the truth, you know, and it's a bunch of crap. When you talk about, you know, that being crap, are you making reference to the allegation that Michael Hobbs Jr. told his friends about the family secret and that family secret being that you killed three little boys? Yeah, we have family secrets. <laughs> I'm going to say that we have them. And but it's nothing about hurting people. My family was in the restaurant business for years. We had 32 restaurants. Our family secrets are our mothers and dads 
recipes. You know, and, and why they blew this up like they did about families, we don't have any. Only our recipes, and we won't give them out. So you're going on record today with darker things and saying, that the family secrets are the recipes and not you murdering three young boys. Exactly. <laughs> it's sad that people believe in anything they hear, you know, and they take it for truth. I have got a lot of messages from people that tell me, I just watched a documentary and they call me every name in the book, you know, and some of them I explain it to, these are documentaries. I call them docudramas because that's all they do. They're, they're all about drama, you know? And uh, so, and some people have apologized and some go on to believe the docudrama. Granted, I mean, I probably, there is some sort of narrative out there that's false or, or spun to garner sympathies for the West Memphis Three, but how do you explain these people who say they were friends with your nephew um, supposedly, they were the ones who were told by your nephew that the family secret was that you killed three little boys, and those individuals passed a polygraph test. How do you explain that, Terry? I'm not sure how they do all that, and I've heard the story, and you know, there's there's nothing to it. But you know, it doesn't matter what I say or what Mike, little Mike says. Little Mike comes to me, and I ask him. Uh, my nephew. I said, did you do this? He said, no, Uncle Terry, I did not. But they put it out there like it means something and it's just a bunch of made up stuff. I imagine you're going to think this next question might be unfair or one of the most difficult ones I'm going to ask you today. But first, how did David Jacoby's hair end up on a tree stump at the crime scene and even more speculative is how did one of your hairs end up on one of the ligatures on the young boy? Well, you need to understand something. I'm not sure that that happened. Okay? I don't think this come from the police. This come from a defense that is out to hurt and do everybody wrong and to get what they want. Okay, and now I can say this. Uh, I'm not sure that that was, I said it a while ago that that was David's hair out there on a stump because and if it was, it doesn't mean nothing. And if it is, if it is my hair in that uh, ligature and I, they haven't convinced me and the police has never said nothing to me about that. But if it is, I don't care. It don't mean nothing. You know, that was my stepson. He lived in my home for six and a half years. If, if it transferred any part, I would be upset if none of us parents had DNA on them kids. You know, they were our kids. Mr. Hobbs, are you telling me and the people that are listening that the evidence was collected by the West Memphis Three's defense team and not by the actual West Memphis Police Department? No, the police has the, uh, all the evidence, but these, you have to, people, don't understand how defense teams work in this country. You know, they can target anybody they want. They can say anything about anybody. They got PR firms that they hire to, you know, to beat up somebody verbally, you know, and emotionally. And that's what they're doing. That's what they've been doing. I imagine you're saying this because in the court of public opinion, you become the suspect much later here in the case and you were, in fact, interrogated. How did that feel, and how did that come about? Well, first of all, I had the statement from the police where they told everybody that Mr. Hobbs was not a suspect in 1993, and he's not one to date. I've got that article, you know, and it come out of the newspaper. Now, first of all, I wasn't a suspect ever. And second of all, I, I agreed to go talk to the police. They didn't call me in like I was in any kind of trouble. I agreed and said, if this will make it things better, I will gladly come over and, and talk to you guys. But at the same time, 
1993, I talked to the police, you know, and they, you know, we agreed to do this, but I answered every question back in 1993 that was asked of me. Well, I appreciate you being open, honest, and transparent with the police, and uh, I appreciate you uh, for allowing us to conduct this interview. Just as we start to wrap things up, I want to give you equal time or say or an opportunity to speak your mind. Um, what are your personal thoughts about the West Memphis Three, uh, Jesse Muskelly Jr., Jason Baldwin, Damian Eccles as people? Well, if you if people have noticed, and I guess they don't really pay attention, all they or all they have noticed is three guys or one guy out of the three says I didn't do it. Now I don't under, I don't know if people noticed this, but here recently they've been Damien Eccles has been saying I want the ligatures tested. Have you noticed that? That is the only piece of evidence that he wants tested. Now has people not figured that out? There's a reason why he wants only that one piece tested. He knows that this is a bunch of us sitting around thinking about all this, you know. We're trying to figure out why just the one piece of evidence, why not test it all? You know, if you know, I'm a parent, test it all. That's how I think. But no, Mr. Echoes only wants one piece tested, and there's a reason for that. Okay? He did not touch them ligatures, would be my guess. Okay? And he knows that. So he that's the only piece he wants tested. Now, at saying that, you have to notice that Mr. Uh, Jesse Miss Kelly said he left the crime scene early because he couldn't stomach it. Okay, so in from what we've seen on his confession, there was three people out there. If he left the crime scene early, and that leaves Jason Baldwin and Damian Nichols. Damian Nichols is saying, test that one piece of evidence. He knows he didn't tie him tie them knots. All right, so that's, to me, he's throwing Jason Baldwin under the bus because of that. Now, saying that, there was a necklace found after the trials had begun that belonged to Damien Nichols, and it had our son's blood on it. Okay? They can't dispute that. That's in the evidence sealed up today. Yes, I've heard about the necklace, but um, why wasn't it admitted during the trial? This like was something that got discovered afterwards. I'm a little confused. Can you expound on that? Well, we didn't know about it until the trials was going, but you know, the families were let known that we found the necklace by the state. The state let us know that we found the necklace in Damien Eccles' uh, trailer that he was living in and it had Stevie's blood on it. Now, these are in the case files, if anybody wants to take the time to look. And, but now this is, in America, you can't, if you find something after a trial is going on, you can't introduce it as evidence because that, that sets the stage for a mistrial. So they couldn't use that, but they still have that. They couldn't use it in the trial. And no, your documentary people are not going to mention that because that's not their agenda. Okay, I understand that and definitely can understand how folks can say documentaries have agendas. But you have told your own story, correct, through a book? Um, so you've got to be making some money out of that and your story being told out of that. Would you like to tell me more about your book? Yes, sir. Box Full of Nightmares is Terry Hobbs' personal memoirs on the West Memphis Three murders. Okay, my cousin wrote this book, and it's just back, you know, years ago, 20, 25 years ago, I just, I seen things happening, you know, that was wrong and, and right. I seen both sides of it. So I started documenting things and putting them in a box. And I filled up one box and I started working on box number two. And that is how the name came about, Box Full. And a lot of the things in there 
you know, it, it turned into, you know, uh, bad dreams, nightmares. And there's your title, box full of nightmares. And, but I do, I still have this stuff, you know, and the, but that's how the book came about. And it's really, you know, it's really sad that I have to do this, to, you know, the story. I, I kind of felt like I was put in a position to do this because every time I would go to the and talk to the media, the media would edit everything I said and make me look like I was the bad guy. You know, and I got tired of that. So during my journaling, I addressed this. In the book, I addressed this. And they cannot edit the book. This is our work. And if you want to know some things about this, the case, you know, there's a few things in the book that people didn't know. And it's available on Amazon. All right, Jerry, you're going to have to forgive me for asking this question, but it is the elephant in the room, so to speak, and probably the main reason why people would be listening to this interview. So I'm going to ask it. Did you kill the three boys that night? No, sir, I did not. I'm not hurt by that question because I've answered that question a million times. But I tell the truth about that question. Sometimes it, it gets you down if you let it. And I just try to look at the bright side, the good Lord knows. And one day he said, everybody's gonna stand in front of him and give an account. I hope I get to stand beside him with them three boys walk up in front of him. I wanna hear this one. Well, thank you very much for speaking to us, Terry. I appreciate it. That was my interview with Terry Hobbs. Do you still think he did it? Or do you now see things slightly differently? I look forward to reading all the comments. Until next time, I'm your host, Doug Duncan, reminding you that once you enter the dark, you may never be the same.